can do one of two things, ladies and gentlemen. I can either go through a turgid presentation. <laughs> I actually said to Jonathan, you know, do we really want to go through it? Or well, we can just do Q&A, right? Now, if, if Damon's nodding his head. Q&A, Damon? You, OK, so you're defeated, Jonathan. You're, new, I, media, I, 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 new media takes out old media. I said do both. Do both. Well, let's, let's, tr let's try, let's try uh, questions. Anyway, if anybody's got any questions, I'm forced back on the back foot. Damon, are you going to go come out with questions? You're going to say, what do I prefer, Google or Facebook? Yeah, OK, there's a lady. You see, ladies are the only ones who are brave enough. Come on. What it was like. Um, now, now, wait, wait a second. How did I feel? I actually, no, I felt really good actually. No, uh, is the honest answer. Who are you? Just coming out. We have to get. We have to, you know, be on a little bit more equal ground. Good. Okay. Saved. Um, uh, how did I feel? I, I felt actually very, very good. Um, my father was very, very ill, and um, he died um, on June the 1st, July the 1st, sorry, 1989, just afterwards. So it was a little bit um, tinged, so well, from a personal point of view, not, and I had a very close relationship with him. So I guess from a personal point of view, it was sort of a little bit mixed, but I was, uh, the biggest challenge was, was David. Um, and I don't know how many people know this, but um, I had, I'll, I'll go, because it's quite an interesting story. I find it interesting anyway, can you ask the question? So we knew, I, I wrote what was called in those days a bear hug letter to Ken Roman, who was the CEO. And I remember it very, very clearly because it was a Friday. I was in Farm Street and I had lunch with Arnold Weinstock of GEC. And, um, I knew I was going to send the letter that, that evening at 5 o'clock. And I had lunch with Arnold Weinstock, who, who knew my father very well. My father did business with him. And was one of my heroes. Jules Thorne of Thorne Electrical and Arnold Weinstock were my two sort of business heroes, along with my dad at that time. And I had lunch, and we're talking to Arnold. And Arnold was very conservative. If you remember, you know, he, he accumulated massive cash balances in GEC. And before he died, I again had lunch with him. And he said to him, one of his biggest regrets was he wasn't more expansive, which was sort of interesting in the context of today because the company has got all these trillions of dollars on their balance sheet. So I went back to the office and we did what was termed in those days, it was called a fax attack, right? And we sent the letter by fax and Ken Roman was having a, um, this tells you about the importance of research, was having, a bit, which is a big plug for Cantor, um, and he was, having, he was having a management conference uh, north of New York. Uh, in a hotel run by an ex-JWT guy. It was um, where, where communications were very difficult. In fact, you know, if, I think if you still go out there with a Blackberry, it doesn't work. One of the few places in the world where it doesn't work. Uh, and it was also the weekend that Ogilvy chose to move to Worldwide Plaza. And just to get in, it's a very interesting story because when, when they, they, they had an equity in the Worldwide Plaza, which turned out to be a disaster, but they had an equity. And when they planned the move, because the building was being built, they extrapolated the growth of Ogilvy. Uh, they were agency of the year in, this was 89 that we made the bid, and in 85 they committed themselves to the building, and they, and they were the agents of the year that year or there around. So they extrapolated the growth of the business, because it was doing very well, up to that. So they took 12 floors in this building, and on the weekend that they moved in, they occupied six. So six were empty. And he was having this management, management conference. And then we sent the fax attack. Now, the last paragraph of that letter, and, I, and this has seen the light of day, but not um, explicitly so. The last paragraph said, and we would like David Ogilvy to be chairman of the combined company. Ken Roman sent that letter to David Ogilvy, and he removed the last paragraph, OK? We guessed he would do that. We didn't know he would do that, OK? So when I met David Ogilvy, um, I, and I did, the, I did the research, but I read every book that David had written. So when I, moved it, when I went into the room, and you remember, he called me an odious little jerk, according to the financial terms. Actually, it was an odious little shit. 
um, because the Financial Times in those days would not print the word shit, it would only print you know, a, a four-letter approximation. And we put on the back of our annual report, actually, we did a little car cartoon, and we didn't put OLJ, we put OLS. And a little cartoon of myself. Um, anyway, I went to see David, and David was immensely impressed that I could quote significant chunks of what he'd written. And he was my friend for life, having done that. But during the conversation, I said to him, well, have you seen the letter? And he said, yes, because he was very upset. We knew he'd be very upset and would react emotionally because we were taking, stealing his baby. That's the way you saw it, you know. I mean, having started WPP, you know, I had the same emotion. If somebody did the same to me, I would I feel exactly the same way that he did. So I didn't think there was, you know, there was some <coughs> empathy there. So I said, have you seen the letter? He said, yes, I've seen the letter. I've seen, I said, have you seen the last paragraph? And he said, yes, I've seen the letter, the last paragraph. I said, well, what do you think? And he just didn't know. And we asked him to become chairman of the company, and that was the first time he found out. There were some interpersonal dynamics going on there that we sort of sussed, <laughs> but we really didn't know how serious they were. So the answer, that's just a little, little uh, apocryphal story, not apocryphal story, a real story. Um, how did I feel? Good, very good. Now, having said that, you know, be careful what you want or you wish for, because in 19, you remember, that was 89, we were, had, a, had a pretty good time then, but I took, a, I made a big mistake, probably the biggest mistake that I'm willing to admit publicly having made, <laughs> which is we funded the acquisition of uh, Ogilvy, it was 825 million, it was about, I think, uh, twice our size at that time. JWT was 13 times our size in 87, 89 Ogilvy was about twice our size, and we funded it uh, half, half debt, and half preferred equity. And I'm supposed to know about these things, and I didn't figure out that in a recession, preferred equity becomes debt, because the, the equity doesn't move up to, to absorb the conversion price. And you know, the preferred equity always looked, a convertible preferred, looked very attractive because the coupon was lower because it had a convertible element to it. So you thought you were issuing equity at a higher price, whereas what you were doing was taking on very significant liability. So I learned a very, very tough lesson but I didn't wake up to that fact until 91, 92, and then the rest of this history, but we had to go through a debt for equity uh, swap there, which in, of its time, it was probably the first transaction of its nature ever to take place, certainly in, our, in a service type business. <coughs> so, so the answer to your question is short term, <coughs> elated. Longer term, you know, I, I, or medium term, I had to, to, to take my, get my comeuppance. And long term, very, very good, because I can assure you that today Ogilvy is worth a fortune. It's not worth 825 million. It's worth far more than that. And it's not just in terms, you know, the quality of its people, the quality of its culture, the quality of its history, the quality of its work. I know it's um, somewhat um, the vogue to decry uh, reputation, history, quality, substance, resource. Um, I think, you know, there's got to be balance. And I value the new, but I also value the old. And Ogilvy is a very good example of that, in my view. So, who's next? If there is a next. Otherwise, you get this rubbish. <laughs> okay, over there. Damien, next. Up. Yeah. Yeah, hi. Um, how after are you? Hey, Market. Um, I'm just wondering, there's been lots of toing and froing over this. Has George Osborne and Co., have they done enough to entice your headquarters back from Dublin? Uh, the, the, the simple answer to are we coming back from Dublin is yes. Yes. Um, the, the government, um, pri or the, before they were elected, they signalled that they would, they would change what the Labour government uh, they said. I mean, I saw, I saw uh, Gordon Brown and, and he, uh, a, few, a few months ago, and you know, he, he, he was always very upset that we had left, uh, that we, we'd gone. And I said, well, Gordon, you know, we, we went because you, you, you communicated that you were going to tax overseas profits. Because, by the way, there's a lot of misinformation, as often in the press, not in Haymarket journals, but um, <laughs> in, in, in Absolutely other things. Not. I mean, just to give you an example of how bad the press is. So I, I was interviewed in the Sunday Times, and I said, you know, because I, I, I love Singapore, and I, I love the Singaporean government and what Lee Kuan Yew and, and, and his son have done in, in Singapore. And I said, I'm willing to take a bet 
that a major international company will locate itself in Singapore within five years. That was on Sunday. On Monday morning, The Telegraph runs an article saying, Sorrell says WPP is moving to Singapore. <laughs> Which then gets picked up by Campaign in Asia, you naughty boy, um, and gets run as WPP is moving to Asia. Anyway, so I, I said, well, Gordon, Gordon Brown said, I, we didn't say that. We didn't say we were going to tax. But well, I can assure you, you that it was communicated to us that they were going to tax overseas profits. So we'd have a double tax on our profits. So it wasn't we moved to Ireland because it's a lower tax rate. That's, we don't have much in the way of Irish profits. What we have is per, small and perfectly formed, like me, but it, <laughs> it, is, it is small, very small. So the issue was that. Now, the, the coalition, or not the coalition, the Conservative government or Conservative part of the government said before the election that they were going to make, make that clear. And the coalition confirmed that. And they've introduced legislation now, which is in the process of going through Parliament. Um, if they have other, any, any time left, apart from discussing reform of the House of Lords. Um, and if that goes through, we'll have a shareholder vote, the border on, on side shareholder vote, and we, and we will come back. And I anticipate that will be sometime next year. So we will come back. Um, as to whether the coalition, I think the coalition did the right thing at the beginning. Uh, they haven't actually reduced the rate, the reduced spending. Um, none of the people in this room who run a business inflation adjust your revenues or your costs, but that's what the Treasury does. So when they talk about cutting spending, they talk about cutting inflation adjusted spending, right? And, and we don't do that, we look at the nominals. And nominal spending by the British government is going to rise from about 700 billion pounds, I think it is, to 750 billion pounds between 2010-2015. Uh, what they've done is reduce the rate of increase. You know, if you were taking over a company that was in trouble and had a, it was losing money, you'd try and reduce your costs and get the revenues and costs into balance. I think they've done sort of the first part was the right thing to do. And you know, if you look at some of the statements by people like Christine Lagarde and the IMF, it certainly improved the position of the, the, the British of Sterling and of the British economy in the eyes uh, of markets, etc., and I think that did help. I think the problem is, and so I find myself paradoxically agreeing with Vince Cable, um, the problem is that we don't have much of a plan, or it doesn't seem we have much of a plan. Um, and you know, this is a bit apple pie and motherhood, I know, but, but if you again go back to Singapore, or Singapore's five million people, if you look at China, right, you, and I recommend you look at the there's an English translation of the 12th five-year plan, if you find these things interesting, but it is interesting, actually. It's very simple. I mean, it is, it is detailed, because the implementation is so strong, and the Chinese are very, very strong in implementation. But there is a plan. You know, the 12th five-year plan is about savings to consumption, about um, social security safety net, because the reason people save in China is because they're worried about being old and their parents being old, so they want, they want social security safety net. And the third thing, the role of service companies is going to become more and more important. So, you know, it almost reads like a charter for WPP or, the, or our, in, our industry uh, in China. We don't have that here. We don't have a, a, a cohesive, comprehensive, reasonably detailed plan that deals with education and technology and infrastructure, hard and soft. It's not just about airports, it's about broadband and everything else, about immigration policy, about taxation policy. It's not being put together. And, and the other thing is that you know, I find quite extraordinary, which we were talking about, this is, not, this is not Chatham House, is it? I suppose this is open. But the other thing I find quite extraordinary is that the budget gets leaked, whoever leaked it. And everything gets leaked except one thing, which is the granny tax. Which if I was doing it, I would leak the granny tax and leave all the other goodies to, to, to the end. The other thing that didn't make sense from my point of view, you might think it was the reverse, was that reducing the rate of income tax from 50% to 45% at this stage made absolutely no sense whatsoever. It's politically explosive. It, it, it's £100 million to the Treasury. So it's, it's bumpkers. I mean, it, it's nothing. So why do it? You could have said, we'll reduce it to 45 or 40 over the life of the Parliament. I think satiated the Conservative right, if that's where you were getting the pressure, and, and deal with it. So, the answer to your question, I think, from my perspective, is they've done a good job, the initial job. They have to get the plan in place. So they had the opportunity on November the 29th, which is when they, they made the Treasury statement, they didn't do it. They had the opportunity in the budget. There's stuff in the budget which is very good. 
small manufacturing enterprises, small enterprises, medium-sized businesses, you know, finance and credit and, and making life a little bit easier from a regulatory point of view. There is good stuff there, but they've just not pulled it together in a comprehensive, cohesive way. So, uh, just while I've got the microphone still, talking about government spend, um, were you surprised to see the central government post-COI um, saying they were going to increase its um, ad spend in the next year? No, absolutely not, because I'm very bullish, quite apart from what Jonathan sort of said, I'm very bullish, which is if I had got round to my presentation, I would give you nine good reasons why you should be bullish about, about our industry. No, I'm not surprised at all. Um, I mean, you know, what the government has done, obviously, is disband the COI. I think, uh, this is going to get myself in terribly hot water, I think the COI is the right thing, <coughs> You know, if I was, if they asked me for a view, I think having a government agency that pulls things together is the right thing to do. I think the COI did overexpand. I, I, you know, I always think about, so it said somebody yesterday, it was 600 people. I understand it got up to 800 people. It was sort of, it was just like an amoeba. I mean, it was just spreading everywhere. <coughs> and um, I think it got too big. And I think that was the problem. What it, what's interesting has happened is, you know, it was cut back and it sort of has now re reappeared in a different form. Yeah. But you do have to have coordination, integration of government departments. Interestingly, if you go to other countries, they use the COI as a model, yeah. right? Because what it does, instead of having, you know, your silos, and of course, you know, we know what happens before elections, political spending by governments in the year before an election or in the year of the election explodes. And it's the same in Australia, it's the same in Brazil, because ministers get their messages over by using those budgets in some way, shape or form. So, you know, I, if, you, if your question is, am I in favour of the COI, I guess the answer is yes, but not too much of it. Yeah, we're just, uh, Damien was then next, and not Paul. Yeah. What excites you about the, the industry right now? Well, you're, you're entitled to say that, Damien, because, you know, you sit on, t on top of a, or at the near, nearly on top of, a $200 billion colossus. I mean, twice the size of Facebook, actually more than twice the size, given what's happened in the market, than Facebook. No, but I, I do agree with you. I think, you know, I did a session with uh, Tim Bell and uh, who was it? Frank Lowe, um, uh, um, sort of connected to Mad Men. You know, and was Mad Men, you know, the, the wonderful past? Uh, and the answer is, I think these are, we're, we're all three of us are older gentlemen, or certainly older. Um, uh, and we look back in the past with rose-tinted spectacles, and I think, I think I, I'm in 150% agreement with you. I think, I think what we're going through at the moment is, and what we will go through, given some of the things, you know, Jonathan covered all my territory, really. Uh, it's, it's, it's more interesting, and we were talking with Luke and others just to, you know, about places like Vietnam and South Korea and Myanmar and China and Brazil. Geographically, it's, you know, we're now in our 108th country. Ogilvy have just gone into Myanmar last Monday. Uh, we, we repurchased an agency that we had had to to get out of because of the, uh, the sanctions on, on, on Burma or uh, Myanmar. Um, it's more interesting than it's ever been. Having said, and then because of technology, I mean, our strategy is new markets, new media and consumer insight, as you know. And it's more interesting for all those, those reasons. On the other hand, it is more challenging. I mean, with all due respect, five years ago, if we were having an institutional presentation, they would mention the G word. And, and, and Google was going to eat our lunch, and uh, we, 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 to some extent we are jointly eating lunch uh, at the moment. We are jointly eating lunch, but every day we do it. And um, Google, you know, as you know, I, we, we talk about, or certainly I talked about it being a frenemy. Uh, Google is a friendlier frenemy than it's been, but there is still a feeling in the industry that you will displace us in some way, shape, or form, and that's displacing the agencies. Now, um, the playing field, the playing field that Google inherits or, or inhabits, is much more level today, I think, than it was 
five years ago. So five years ago, when those analysts were saying about the G word, by the way, having got rid of the, not rid of the G word, but having managed to weather a bit of the G word, they then said, you're going to be destroyed by the R word, which is recession. Um, and we managed to weather that a bit. So I don't know what the third word is. It's coming down the line, but there will be another one. Um, but five years ago, Google was really dominant. You know, search, its position, so well, you still have a, a, an almost dominant position in search, but, but Microsoft with Bing and Yahoo, I think, have probably have given us an alternative. It may not be as strong an alternative as our clients or indeed ourselves would want, but it's stronger. But in addition to Google, you obviously have Facebook, you have Twitter, you have Amazon, you have Apple. Uh, you know, Apple is a $500 billion company. People talk about it being a trillion dollars. It's the world's most valuable company, I think, still. More ver worth more than Exxon in a relatively short period of time. So the playing field is much level, much more level. Having said that, and Damien knows, because I said this at the Zeitgeist, well, I didn't get the opportunity to say it at the Zeitgeist, but you know, I've said it to him, and his, uh, Google has a fantastic position. It has, it has uh, strength in five areas. It has strength in search. It has strength in display. It has strength in video. It has strength in social. Some people might argue about Google Plus being better or worse than Facebook. And last and most importantly, it has strength in mobile. And its ability to, and it approved, it went through China regulatory authorities last week, the, the acquisition of uh, Motorola Mobility, which by the way, doubles up its workforce. So it has, takes on another 18,000 people. Uh, so Dennis Woodside is going to have his work cut out. But having said that, it's a fantastic opportunity because I don't think it is about patents. I think it's about linking hardware and software. And Google's position in mobile, I think, is potentially the most exciting thing. We've been frustrated as an agency, agency group by the lack of development of mobile uh, advertising and marketing. We think that is one of the primary drivers. I mean, if you look at... China, China Mobile, we valued this week in the Brand Z survey as the most valuable brand outside America. Why? Because it's got 650, 700 million subscribers on one network in China, 950 million in China as a whole. India has 850 million subscribers, three 100 million plus networks, Airtel, Vodafone, and uh, what's the other one? Reliance. All over 100 million. Mobile is the real driver of these economies, not like the way we've seen it, but on a scale that we've never seen before, and it's the cheap form of access to the internet. So mobile, I think, and coming back to Facebook, uh, is it worth 100 billion? Well, you know, market's spoken, it's not worth 100 billion, it's a little bit less. Um, its problem is, and um, we said this months ago, and I'm gonna say I told you so, its problem is that it is a social network. That's what the film was called. It's about social conversations. You invade social conversations at your peril. If you're on a search and you define what it is, you know, if you're looking for an ice cream parlor, I mentioned that because that was the first piece of creative work that Facebook showed us at the CES conference in, in Las Vegas in January. If you're looking for an ice cream or an ice cream parlor and you're searching, fine. You get a Ben and Jerry's, you know, what goes, good, what goes well with a freshly baked waffle cone was the question we were asked. But if you're having a social conversation with your friends or your kids or your wife or whatever on Facebook and suddenly Ben and Jerry's pops up, what do you think? So I, I just have a fundamental issue about that. So we're starting to see that issue come to the fore. How do you monetize a social interaction? And then allied to that is ROI. How do you measure it? Because clients are now starting to spend significant sums of money. The biggest spender on Facebook, as far as I'm aware, spends about $125 million. Average is about 25 to 50. These are not small sums of money, and procurement and finance are starting to look at that and say, where's the return? And the third leg they've got to look at is, mo is mobile. And you buy, Inst well, they bought Instagram, I think, prior to the float basically because they saw that as, a, as a, an entry into mobile. So net-net, I think Damien's right, it is much more exciting than Mad Men, although the Mad Men series is wonderful and, and I love watching it, I think, as much as anybody else does. Maybe getting a little bit tired now, but I think it's got, this is series five, is it? I think it goes to series seven and then stops. But it's really great, casting's great, the way it's produced is fantastic, the stories, <coughs> stories are good, but, 
I think today is much, much more interesting geographically. It's much more exciting and functionally. And, and, and this, the best is yet to come. And you know, finally on Google, I think the two big challenges they have is size and regulation. Eric Schmidt, I see just before I came here today, has said that he doesn't understand what's, what the EU is on about. But the regulation issue is going to be something they have to deal with. Who's next? Yeah, right at the back. Uh, Felix Sater, private entrepreneur. Uh, I think you've answered a third of the question that I'm about to ask. And clearly, new media and technology is challenging right. the old way. And uh, you have uh, digital taking on static and print and things of that nature. With that question in mind, and I guess mobile being one of the three directions, what are the three most interesting directions that you see in the way the business will change, both from a consumer as well as advertising You mean standpoint? technology business or things generally? Things generally and how possibly how the technology affects that. OK. Well, OK, so then I resort to my mindset, mindset speech, OK. So there, this gives me an opportunity to unload so Jonathan can't be really upset with me. Okay. So there are no, nine things. I mean, I'm sure there are another nine things or 90 things that you should be aware of, but there are nine things that we see, um, some of which are technology and some of which are, uh, are not. But let me just very quickly. So firstly, it's the geographical bit, right? So, and everybody focuses on the East. Jonathan touched on it. And they focus on China and India. But forget, don't forget the South. So if New York is the center of the world, which I think Americans think so, and I think probably they're right. If New York's the center of the world, so you go south, and you know, we're going to have the Olympics. Uh, we're going to have the World Cup and the Olympics in Brazil. So we're going, to, we're going to think about Latin America in a different way, I bet you, in a few years' time. And I think it would be a good way. And despite the infrastructure challenges, it would be a good way. And it's not just Brazil. It's Colum I did something with Colombia this morning. It's Mexico. It's Argentina, despite its idiosyncrasies. I mean, remember that Argentina was the sixth most uh, strongest economy in the world a few years ago. Uh, so south, southeast, meaning uh, Africa and the Middle East. You know, we have a fantastic business in Africa uh, and the Middle East. Approaching now, it's about uh, 600, 700 million dollars now of revenues just in, in those areas. And then, of course, uh, Central Eastern Europe and Asia. The Eastern shift is a shift that's happening in Europe too. And I think this is a really serious issue because I think it will become a big political issue. The axis, and I use that word advisedly, the axis between Germany, Poland, and Russia is immensely powerful. And I'm very bullish on Russia, primarily driven by energy needs. I mean, the economy is expanding at about 4 or 5%. Uh, Putin will, you know, could be there for 12 years. The cabinet appointments probably are neutral, but he may well have to, to change. But he's going to have to maintain the, what we call the geographical integrity of Russia. It's not the demonstrations you should worry about, I'm told. They're friendly demonstrations. It's the regional integrity, getting the republics to stick together, because they, they have to send all the money to Moscow, and it's getting the balance right in terms of budget. So that's number one. Uh, number two is you would think there was not significant overcapacity post Lehman in most industries. There still is. And take the automobile industry. Our biggest client, Ford Motor Company, is in the automobile industry. You can still produce 80 million cars and trucks in 2012, which was the same level as pre Lehman in 2008. You would think with two companies, two of the big three in Detroit going into bankruptcy, that that would have changed. It hasn't changed. Why? Because the expansion of capacity in India and South Korea and China and other, other markets has grown to compensate for it. One little, little appendix to that is, remember, the Chinese car market is now 18 million units, which is where America was pre-layman, and it's now 12 to 13 million units. I think Europe's about 14 to 15 million units. I met an Israeli entrepreneur in, in China a few weeks ago who's, who's introducing, developing a, a new car with a Chinese manufacturer because he thinks that the Chinese car market will go to 32 million units. So you know, there's rebalances, but there's still overcapacity, which is great for us because we're in the business of differentiating. The shortage is in people, is getting the supply of people right because all the demographics are against you. Third thing is the web. Just, the, impl the influence of the web is disintermediation, and you get disintermediated by a lower cost business model, and they take your people. 
young people don't, don't like to work in big bureaucracies. They don't like to work, you know, and we, we suffer from that as an industry, and I would say in WPP we have to deal with that, and it's very difficult to get the balance right. But young people want to come out to small, technologically based firms which are much livelier and not, and not sclerotic and much more flexible. Retail, the fourth one is retail power. Dis, despite the fact, or maybe as a result, that the, the top three retailers have challenges at the moment. Walmart, Tesco and Carrefour all have challenges. That is putting pressure on the manufacturers. And the manufacturers have very little pricing power. You know, we've had generally had very little retail inflation. We've had commodity price inflation, which has squeezed margins, which has made the relationship between retail and manufacturers even more difficult. That, by the way, I think we get referred pain as suppliers to manufacturers. In fact, I've heard that from clients. I said, you know, why is it so tough? And they say, Martin, it's referred pain. So read that, that battle between retail and manufacturers, people don't think of being a battle. I think it's going to become more significant. One other thing in relation to technology, which is really, I've had three instances in the last two weeks where Amazon has been quoted by three different firms in three different industries as being the most significant competitor they have to deal with. A retailer, an FMCG company, and a transport company. All three, in totally different industries, have said their biggest competitor is Amazon. So I think you know, that's interesting in and of itself. Fifth point is importance of internal communications. Getting the message out for chairman and CEOs internally is more important than external communication. So getting the 158,000 people in WPP in 108 countries to face in the same direction at the same point in time is critically important. Global and local structures is the next issue that we see. There is more global power and coordination, but there's more local influence too. Companies are getting bigger on a country basis. They have to do things at a country level. We're in 108 countries. How is it possible for Mark Liner, our talent guy in New York, to know who are the best people in 108 countries? Or how is it possible for me to know which are going to be the clients of the future or the acquisitions we should look at? So you need people. We need people across WPP at a client level. That's why we've done it with our top 30 clients. And you need people at a country level to look for good people, good acquisitions, and the clients that are going to be the great client, you know, the great multinationals of the future. A power of finance and procurement, I think it's got out of kilter. I'm in danger of putting my foot really in my mouth by, by doing this quickly. But basically, the balance of power inside companies, marketing has, has diminished. And obviously, you know, you, you, they would say, well, he's talking his own book, or we're talking our own books. But it is a serious problem. Because I think clients, particularly in the, in the slow growth markets, in the developed markets, are coming to the view that focusing on cost is more important than focusing on market share or revenues. And as Jeremy Bullmore has pointed out ad nauseum for years and years and years, there's a finite limit to what you can do on costs, whereas at least until you get to 100% market share, there's no limit to what you can do on revenues. So this balance is a real issue, particularly in Western Europe, in the United States. It's not as bad in the BRICS and Next 11, the civets and the mist and everything, because there's growth that can take it. But it's, it's very, very difficult. Eighth point is growth of government. Government is not going to go away. They're going to be with us in, in terms of intervention, regulation, investment, and control for a significant period of time. Look at the 1930s. CSR. Um, you know, there is, the, the, I think it's quote, uh, sort of written on the, uh, the CNN uh, blurb. I, I really believe that no chairman or CEO that we deal with now, or CMO, doesn't put sustainability, social responsibility at the heart of what they do. It's a fundamental part of the strategy. And Luke mentioned uh, John Brown. John Brown actually, in all fairness, was the first person to point this out, really in 1997 at the Stanford Business School, when he, when he did a speech where he said, and he just put one, it's all about one word, we over-intellectualize this. If you're in the business of building brands over the long term, you won't do anything that damages the environment. 
because it, doing good is good business. It's not altruism, it's not charity, it's just doing good things because it does you good. We know from every piece of research that Kantar does that employees value companies that value sustainability and corporate responsibility, and we know, you know employees do that, and we know that customers do that. They may not be prepared in recessions to pay for that privilege, <coughs> but in the long term, they will. Um, and the, the final point, actually, is that this, this is inter interesting, is that, um, and I said this down at the ANA in Florida a few weeks ago, the compensation pressure in the industry, in our industry, which has intensified post Lehman. Po Lehman in, in 2008 was a really interesting event because I don't think it's affected consumer behavior as much as it's affected corporate behavior. And corporates are focused, for reasons I've touched on, retail, inflation, la lack of pricing of that power, on cost. That's put pressure on our compensation. That will only <coughs> result in further consolidation. I'm not saying that we will be the consolidator, but it, it will result in, you know, some of the things going on in terms of this, the quest for efficiency, effectiveness, liquidity, puts greater pressure on the small and medium-sized companies in our industry than the bigger ones. And it's just gonna result and actually, ultimately, it means less choice. So, the, you know, this is a plea for compassion. Because it's in the interests of clients to have strong suppliers. Or str I call them junior partners. I, I don't like vendors or suppliers. I feel better when we describe ourselves not as equal partners, as junior partners. And, you know, some of our clients, what I call highest common multiple clients, where we have very constructive Dialogues, there are some lowest common denominator ones, I won't name them, where it's very tough. And, you know, the best way to get, the best way to get the best out of our people is by treating them as junior partners, not as suppliers or vendors. I really believe that. I mean, you know, you may find it strange coming from somebody who's meant to be a bean counter or an accountant, or even worse, an MBA. Right? <laughs> But I really think it has, it's important. Are we? That's it? Okay. He's telling me to shut up. It's, it's career threatening. Thank you, Martin Tolver, amazing Q&A. Thank you.